Hi, welcome to Alta Heren. My name is Hans, and today we're going to talk about this book. It's been uh, newly uh, translated by, by my friend Rob Ranekers. And uh, with me today is actually my guest, Rob. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, mate. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about this book. Uh, it's called Book of Lessons uh, by Pedro de Heredia. Um, and you, you have worked uh, for a long, long time with this, and you teach it uh, as well in class. Uh, in classes all around the world now. And it's uh, so, can you just start, start a little bit and talk about why you choose this, why you, why you wanted to work with this? Uh, well, quite simply, um, it's down to Sydney Anglo's book, The Martial Arts of Renaissance Europe. And in it, it had these fabulous pictures, these gorgeous pictures, some of the best, I think, that we see in fencing treatises. And uh, we, can, we can take a look at those um, just now, actually. Um, you know, so, so, so things like this, and uh, in this particular yeah. volume, there's 71 of them. And I just thought, what, what is that? <laughs> um, and uh, I managed to get hold of a scan and um, so they scanned it for me and I started reading through it. Um, I, Olivier Dupuy had, had done a, um, a draft transcription as well um, and uh, as is usual I think for a lot of academics the immediate fascination piece, the immediate um, uh, interest of the pictures swiftly became consumed by uh, an interest in the fencing um, and it was it was the curiosity of that book that that's led me to sort of uh, I suppose working on on and off this and on other translations for about three years now um, and bringing this to publication. Okay cool and, and it's been published by we're gonna say the Fallen Rook uh, in Scotland right? Uh, yeah it's Keith Farrell's lot um, he's actually in Liverpool at the moment um, oh, okay uh, but um, uh, they, they are based uh, originally in, in, in Glasgow themselves. So it's quite ironic, really, that the um, uh, one of the additions to the treatise is, is in is, is right next door to them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and, and, and Keith Farrell, um, just a shout out to him. He's he's one of the best guys out there for um, uh, people like me, other other translators <laughs> who are really trying to work bringing these texts to life and are working on the the H part of him, the historical side. So uh, great thanks to him and Fallen Rook. And we have to say that the other original is actually kind of uh, next door to me because it's in the Royal Library in Stockholm, which is kind of cool. It, it's brilliant, actually, because, um, uh, I mean, the Scott Collection, like many, many collections, um, are prohibitively expensive if mm -hmm. one wants to publish. Uh, and that, that's a major blocker. Um, I mean, there's an ongoing argument about these things. The museums are concerned about um, obviously their own funding, but the people are going to make a profit from it. People like me are going, you know, much as we'd like to make a profit from, you know, 17th century fencing manuals, <laughs> it's, we're not quite J.K. Rowling yet. Um, so, uh, but they, they, they unfortunately were prohibitively expensive. And then, then of course, this man, Hans Jordlin, just wanders into the Swedish Royal Library, goes, uh, can, can we publish these? I go, yeah, sure. Yeah. And and we're blessed with these these seventy one fabulous fabulous pictures. Yeah, you know, the, you know They're things. Like, I don't know if you can see absolutely it. Absolutely beautiful, things. colorful, detailed in a in a way that you, you never you pretty much never see in a manual. Okay, we're going to talk about this um, book of lessons. It's called uh, the historical fencing treatise attributed to Pedro de Heredia. Uh, is this the guy who wrote the manual? Now, there was a leading question. Oh, okay. uh, the Book of Lessons, one of the reasons why it's a fascinating treatise to me is it's it's not straightforward. So it's not like someone where you've got Salvatore Fabris who uh, produces several books, the 1602, the 1606, etc., that are um, very well recognised, you know the author, you know for whom it's for and stuff like that. All we've got to say that this is actually Pedro de Heredia um, in, in relation to the actual treatise is on the inside cover there is a reference by a librarian in Brussels dating to 1900 mm -hmm. calling this a treatise of arms um, and that it's Pedro de Heredia. Now there are several Pedro de Heredias and because of that there's been all sorts of confusion. So there's a uh, bibliography from the 
I think from the 19th century, maybe a bit later, that says there is a, a treatise by Pedro de Heredia that's 16th century. Now we know this has to be later than the 16th century, uh, or at least the, uh, up until the very end of the 16th century, because the beginning of this is actually from <coughs> Caval Cabo, and with a little bit by Pater Nostria, and as far as we know, those volumes published together were only published after 1597 in France. The original Italian of Caval Cabo is, is just Caval Cabo, and as far as I'm aware, does not have Pater Nostria, so that, and, and, and that may be like 1595 or a bit before. So our, our idea, the, 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 the bibliographer, the Spanish bibliographer who thought this was 16th century is wrong, and he probably thought it was the famous Pedro de Heredia, who was a conquistador, who died before this was made. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, as we go into in the introduction, there are uh, references to a Pedro de Heredia who um, lived in Brussels. So he's in the right area for where the book ended mm. up. And he was captain of horse and he married into a uh, family in the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's about the right time for that guy to be there. And he was reasonably high status enough. There are issues with this, though. The the pictures in this are are incredibly expensive to have made. One can infer the inks are expensive. They were big. They were. I mean, you've, you've seen them in the flesh hands, haven't you? They're about that yeah. big. So they're big pictures. A lot of ink. A lot of efforts gone into them. There are yeah. corrections on them. Mm -hmm. So they're expensive. Whether the governor of Brussels could have afforded it um, is really open to question we, we we don't know what his lifestyle was uh, that that requires more research so it is problem with that the second thing of course uh, with this being um the idea of this being an author is you've got cabal cabo at the beginning and then you have arguably two maybe three additional sets of text afterwards that are all put together now in the treatise they're all written beautifully in this gorgeous handwriting um, and, in, and it all flows into one. But when you read it, it's all in quite significant sections. Okay. Um, and the titles uh, appear to have been written after the main text was written. There's, there's lots of little things about this that I go into in the introduction. Mm -hmm. And then the last bit, uh, coming back to the pictures, is the fashion is pertaining to sort of German stroke Dutch Spanish yeah. Netherlands fashion from about the 1620s, the 1630s, 40s. So much later than Cabal Cabo. So we've got this period where this book is being collated. And I'd, I'd use the word collated rather than written over a long period with various different things, possibly different styles um, and possibly different people. So um, it's, it's for me, it's fascinating, but it can also be infuriating if you just want to have the one guy who's teaching this. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> okay, uh, so when you when you talk about French, uh, Spanish, Netherlands, and everything, what was this kind of written in that area? You would say, produced in that area, so uh, by someone from around that area. Is that is that? Can we say anything about that? Or I'd say it's a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Um, obviously, Caval Cabo, uh, the text that's written by him or by his students um, is originally turns up in Italy, uh, but it becomes very popular in France because he teaches the Dauphin, the future Louis XIII, and his brother Gaston d'Orléans. So uh, it gets translated into French with the Paternostri bit I mentioned earlier, which is why I think the, the beginning of this book is slightly later. And that in turn is also um, uh, translated into German. Mm. So it's, it's a very popular text. Um, now, the French king had a lot of um, control over what was published in France. So lots of authors did escape over, or well not escape, they went over to the, uh, the border, to the Spanish Netherlands uh, to publish stuff. So it could be possible that if this were to be published, they've gone across the border. It is published in French, by the way, a very, very nice French um, with some little bits of Spanish in it. And that may also indicate a Pedro de Heredia, maybe mm -hmm. this Spanish soldier um, who's living in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, what about this? What about the, the because you mentioned now that there might be 
several people who wrote it. Uh, what about, is there one type of fancy, is there one style that we can see in this? If we, if we look at the, for instance, pictures, the, the stances, the guards, and the, can we say anything about the style of, of, of fencing here? Um, style of fencing is really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I will answer that in a second, but I think um, there's a caveat. Mm -hmm. um, all fencing is an interpretation. Um, I, I do feel that at times we, you know, we, we run along with interpretation perhaps too much or we, we take certain aspects and leave other aspects mm -hmm. um, and that can harm our interpretation in turn. So, for example, Fabris 1606 could be seen as a, uh, a text not purely for fencing, but very much what the king of the time, Christian IV, wanted to display in his court. It's a lot mm -hmm. to do with the Renaissance IV. Um, so we, we have to be careful with interpretation. This is collected, I think, over a 30 year period. And I think these are things that the individual found of interest at that time or several people found of interest. This is great because this this therefore means you've got a contemporary or someone who's somewhat after somewhat after pulling together lessons that for them, for their style of fencing mm -hmm. is really, really useful. The principles as well as the techniques, they're deriving something from it so much so that pictures are produced to support it. Now, those pictures may not pertain to Cavalcabo. I would argue from my end. No, they may not pertain to a large number of the lessons they may be something else but they're derived they're drawn on someone's drawn inspiration from this so this this text to me is a living breathing work it's something that someone's compiled that's useful for them or for their family who knows um as lessons uh so when you talk about style it's it's difficult i think because what the original writer intended may not be what someone's derived and perhaps neither of those are wrong. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're both really good things. To come back to, do I feel there's a, um, an interpretive style? Obviously, um, <clears throat> Italian forms are in there. Uh, there is a style of lunge, which uh, is first mentioned by Francois Doncy in 1623, or rather the earliest that I'm aware of is that time, yeah. uh, which could be seen as a form that derives in French speaking areas or in France, that may be highly interpretive. And we see it later in Italian forms. We see it in um, Villa Dita, Marcelli, and it's mentioned by later um, Spanish authors uh, in, in how to actually defeat the Italian lunge. So, so maybe there's something <coughs> going on there. And then you've got techniques which are how to fight the mathematical form. Uh, one, one thinks is, is noble distress. So we've got a bit of Italian there, possibly one could infer some French, for want of a better term, and I think you've got something there which is common distreza, i.e. that which is not the, uh, one might say, the state-sanctioned form that was used by the um, the nobility of Spain, but certainly that used more commonly, uh, though one has to be very careful because uh, for the Spanish authors at the time, anything that was not noble distreza was common, regardless of <laughs> So um, uh, co common meaning very, very common in the sense of widespread. Um, so uh, I think there's a, a lot of things that one can um, possibly interpret into this. For me, it's very much that it is a breathing text. Um, I just want to thank Dave Rawlins, by the way, who gave a superb view, um, mm. view on this. And he's using this for deriving the lessons. And this is one of the great things about the format of the text is, yes, you've got the beginning, the, the principles, but then you've got lesson after lesson after lesson yeah. with very subtle variations um, on each particular move, which is, uh, I'll get shot for this by people like Tom Puen, Alberto Bonprezzi, but <laughs> it's a little bit, it reminds me of some of the Spanish uh, noble texts because it's very much taking, this is the form and then variations mm -hmm. of, yeah. though it's not mathematical to the, the degree that they are, it's not scientific to that degree, but it's great for picking up lessons and going, okay, we are going to work on a pass. And mm. it's got so many variations. And you can look at all the various different things you've got. It, it's, um, for a modern fencer, uh, I, I, it's, it, it's a gold mine, um, or, or at least for me, it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about it. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you. Uh, what about the, <clears throat> what, what about the, the, the weapons itself? It has a single sword, uh, sword and dagger, and 
also double sword, two swords. Um, but the pictures it, uh, themselves, the swords are very, very detailed and very, very uh, thin in a way. My theory is, and I think yours as well, is that it's because of uh, the, the 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 writer and the author want to authors uh, wants to show us the details of the hands, the fingers, all these little things that are so important in this kind of fencing. Do, do, is that? Do, are you? Do, do you think the same? Uh, yes, I do. The, the pictures are misleading and yet also really helpful, um, yeah. as, as are most of the pictures from this period for anyone who's had to deal with them. Um, so at times the arms are a little bit rubberish and managed to bend in all sorts of shapes. Uh, but at other times the postures and, and them are fantastic and the hands have got immense detail on them. Yeah. Uh, they are showing um, a sword, which one could argue we do see from the middle of the... Um, uh, 17th century, or rather in, in mid-17th century texts like uh, Charles Benard from 1653, has something a little bit akin like this, mm. and it shows the hand um, on on the grip rather than the fingers being put through um, mm. the uh, any, any of the forward rings. So um, it's very helpful like that. The pictures don't always follow the text, and it may be that the captions are also written at different times the pictures, um, which which can be problematic in some ways, but with a little bit of work, it, it, it does become clear. Um, that The hand positions I do find fantastic. Uh, and also something that's interesting about the pictures is it shows a lot of mm -hmm. techniques on how to deal with the lunges. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is superb, because uh, a lot of the techniques are described by various Spanish authors as well, which may, you know, bring in this distreza or vulgar distreza influence. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the other thing, of course, about the pictures, the, the, the faces are, are, are wonderfully charismatic. There, yeah, there's yeah. A, a, a lot of things in there. But these can't be just dismissed as hit and miss. You see a lot of corrections on them, on the rough outs. You see pencil lines yeah. uh, on there. So, so I, I think there is a lot of detail that's going on here, and they are representing something, albeit, again, later than the main treatise. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Uh, do you have anything you want to add about this? Uh, well, kind of thanks to you uh, for helping me get hold of the, uh, <laughs> uh, the pictures. Um, hell, I'm flogging a book, so obviously I'm going to be a fan of it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say it's, it's a wonderful text. Um, it's a great text for teaching. And it's structured for, for, for students, so students can really take this and use it. Um, yes, it is. It does. <laughs> You know, it really, you've touched on saying that, it really does remind me of student notes. Now, that's a huge, you know, interpretive leap. So, you know, don't don't believe that's actually actually what's happening. But when you read through these, you, you've really got the feeling of someone writing down and then sort of writing up their notes after yes. the lecture. Okay. Um, and it, 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 it's just great. Okay. Thank you so much for this, Rob. Thank you. And, uh, well, we'll see you next time. Okay. Cheers, mate. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.